I noticed, I know that that one of your your passions, as you just mentioned, when you talk about standards and expectations, is trying to raise the the quality of what's happening in a school building, what's happening in a classroom, around uh, content, around culture, around norms. Uh, I noticed that on your PowerPoint you had a, a picture of your curriculum unit. Yeah. Now you might have just put that on there for us no, today. Say, where I go. <laughs> <It's over here. laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And <laughs> you, <laughs> you've been a fellow three times in uh, uh, at the National Initiative, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that experience from your standpoint in terms of, um, you know, what it was like to being here, we're working with your colleagues, you know, working with faculty members, how do you, how do you, re you reflect on that experience as, it, as impacting you as a teacher? Well, it really made me who I am. I was telling um, you know, the meeting earlier today that there were three times I considered leaving education, 2011, 2014, and 2018. Each time I came up, I came up here to the seminar and I got rejuvenated. Re-energized to stay in the classroom, to stay focused, to keep doing the work. But each time, I saw a need within my students, and coming up here allowed me for, to fulfill that need. And the best thing about it is, my kids are using the lessons. You know, from the unit I wrote about the history of the neighborhoods. You know, in 2014, my kids used that mm -hmm. to advocate for the against the mayor building a ballpark on historic. African American ground and seeing them get involved and becoming involved as part of the historical commission to rededicate those grounds to, you know, I was telling the story, this I tell the full story now. But I said this is one I had a student. We had done my curriculum unit last year in Yale. Yeah, I mean my um, unit I developed in your class about the system. And I remember going to the class today, this kid's like smiling and happy, which Ain't really a thing you get from teenagers at 7.30 in the morning, <laughs> you know? But he was like, I'm going home. I go to court today, I'm going home. And I was like, usually you, people don't smile when they say they're going to court. And so he was excited. And so I was like, all right, see you later, you know? And I was expecting him to come back from court, come back to class. So two hours later, he walks by my classroom, he throws me the peace sign. You know, he's going to his room to get his stuff to go home. And so I, I couldn't figure out what had happened because I didn't get a chance to talk to him before he left. And he, um, the judge came and talked to me. And the judge like, this young man sat in my courtroom and told me, according to the 1968 case of Terry versus Ohio, which established the precedent for police searches, I was illegally searched. You know, because he had guns and a gun on him. <laughs> and so the judge like, I looked at his at the details of the case, and he was absolutely right. And so I dismissed his charges, and he went home. You know, and so that, that's the type of impact that I wanted this unit to have. You know, and now that kid's in college. This is just a mistake. He got caught making a mistake, and he lost that. And so he's a kid in college right now. And he said he wants to be a social worker or a lawyer. You know, so it's just like, that's what it's like. Just seeing that impact, you know, I can point to a concrete evidence of he used what I taught him to save his life, you know, so that's the awesome part. So we talked about, you know, your background and some of your experience um, going out as the Teacher of the Year, and then we talked about a little bit about the uh, initiative at Yale and then also locally, and I want to go back up to the broader kind of policy level um, because I know that one of the things that happens now is that you get asked and you've, you've, you already have and now you've further developed a set of expertise. Um, so um, I want you to imagine that you are, uh, you are advising or, you know what, let's not even make you advising. Let's just make you the, uh, the um, head of either, you, you can imagine this as, as a school district, a local school district if you want to. You could take this question as a governor, or you could take this question as secretary of education, whatever at the national level, whatever level you want to attack it on. But really what I want to know is, um, what do you think of when you think of the kinds of things that, that the governments need to do to support education that are not being done now? Like, what is the 
top of your list? Oh, wow. Um, this may sound silly, but money. Um, you know, so many places... Silly. So many places are struggling to fund their school systems, yeah. and we need directed money, and we need a directed purpose. So, all right, fine. I just know. I'm Secretary of Education. I'm in charge of making educational policy. Good. I, I, already, I already like how this sounds. Yes. <laughs> I would attack several things. Number one, I work in the juvenile detention center, so the school to prison pipeline is real to me. And so I would attack some policies that I feel lead directly to the school to prison pipeline. Number one is exclusionary discipline. You know, if the purpose of school is to educate children, why are we putting them out of school? Out of school? They're not getting education if they're not in school. Um, so I would definitely do that. Number two, I would pretty much reduce or slash eliminate school resource offices because my kids, that's where it starts. A lot of their first charges, their first interactions are with school resource officers. If you remove the political correctness of that term, they're, they're police officers. They're not school resource officers. They are police officers. I would completely remove them from the discipline process of schools. We don't need them handling discipline because that's what's um, leading. And then I would fund Title II. For those in the Title II is professional development. You know, districts need professional development, from specifically from a point of culturally relevant education. You know, we have a, a education field that is 80% white, but 50% of the students are students of color. And so we need to address those things. We need to train the white teachers to be culturally relevant and actually look at the models that are actually working. There are tons of models in the United States that are working. We need to fund those, and we need to make sure that they're available to everybody. Two, we need more teachers of color in the classroom. And I would definitely invest in HBCUs. Mm -hmm. Because we're talking 3% of United States colleges that are producing 50% of teachers of color in the country. So right? you would have to definitely invest in those schools to get more teachers of color. And then I would eliminate testing. I would use testing strictly as diagnostics. You know, we, you know, I often tell this, you know, testing doesn't mean a damn thing to a student trying to survive the daily life. Right. And so it's important that we use testing as diagnostic tools to measure where our kids are and where they need to grow. But as far as telling the student that they pass or fail, that is an extremely disheartening thing to the students, to the teachers. I worked in the school for 12 years where I know I've worked harder than any teacher in the district than the state to come in and tell you, oh, you're failing. Yeah. You know? And so that just kills the morale of the school, the morale of the students and just the whole testing environment. Forget about the whole history, the racial history of testing and what they were intended to do. We need to actually educate our students. We need to prepare them for the 21st century and uh, respect teachers to be the professionals that they are to get our students ready for the 21st century. What's next for Rodney Robinson? I don't know. I really don't know this. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating when I say there's literally a new option every day when I'm on the road, where I talk to someone and things, you know, and so I really don't know. One thing I do know, that it's not in the classroom. I've always said I love to be in the classroom, but I'm needed in this room more mm -hmm. because I see that there are decisions being made by people who don't have the cultural relevance to make those decisions. But I clearly want to be at the table where there are policy and decisions that are being made to represent you know, my students or people that come from my background because um, you get to the table and one of the things I, I, rust, I wrestled with when I became teacher of the year was I don't just want to become the teacher of the bad kids, the teacher that works in the detention center. I'm a, I'm a master of pedagogy. I can walk into any school in America and teach any kid. So I didn't want to be put in that box. But as I travel, I have to be in that box because no one else is speaking up or no one else is saying the things that need to be said to represent underrepresented populations. That's what I want to do. I just want to speak my truth. Mm -hmm. And so whatever position I take after this year would definitely be one where I'm not constrained and where I can speak my truth and advocate what's best for all kids in America. Mm -hmm. Can I give you some advice? What? Whatever, when you're trying to make this decision, because you do have a new opportunity every day, and as you narrow it down and you get to just a few, 
I want to share with you uh, a concept that I hope you'll apply to that decision-making process. It comes from a guy I know, great Rodney Robinson. <laughs> Just make sure you're living in your why. <laughs> Thank you.